Okay, so thank you for the invitation. It's very nice to be here in the serum. Uh, so I want to talk about this uh, complex cellular structure. So I'll basically be following this uh, paper, which, so uh, any references you can find here, this is complex cellular structure, same as the title of my talk in Annals 2019. So the only problem is it, it's kind of more of a book than a paper, so it's very long. So I'll try to, I, I will not exactly follow the order of the paper, I'll try to kind of motivate things in a different order. And actually this has a lot to do with singularities. It's kind of inspired by resolution of singularities, but the goal is a little bit different. So the, some techniques are similar, the, the, the goal is different, and I kind of, I should say that Dmitry Novikov, my co-author, and I, we are not really experts in resolution of singularities, so we used some basic ideas from resolution of singularities, like uh, monomerizations of ideals and you know, bringing things to normal crossing divisors. But uh, it's quite possible that you know, the same analogy can be carried further with other deeper ideas from resolution of singularities that we just don't really know about. So maybe after you understand what, <laughs> what these complex area structures are about, maybe you can expand it in some direction. Okay, but I'll start with uh, motivation that doesn't come from resolution of singularities. It comes from uh, work of uh, Yosef Yomdin and, and Gromov. So this is about the Yomdin-Gromov algebraic lemma, and this was kind of our initial reason for, for looking in this direction. So Yomdin-Gromov algebraic lemma. And, well, this is a lemma that was, it has an interesting history. It was first proven by Yossi Yomdin, and he used it to prove some results in dynamics. So he, he solved the Schub's entropy conjecture using this lemma. And it wasn't exactly the lemma that I'm going to show you. So he proved a slightly more technical, weaker version, and then Gromov was giving a Bourbaki lecture about this, and he kind of improved Yomdin's presentation. He made it very clean. And so th this Gromov's formulation is what we now call yomdin gromovs algebraic lemma. Uh, if I have time, maybe in the end, I might talk about the, why this lemma is interesting. So what it was used for in analysis, and now it's, it's also being used in number theory. But for now, I'll just state the lemma. It's, it's kind of very clean and interesting <laughs> by itself. So I'll start with some notation. So if uh, phi from 0, 1 to L into say Rn. If this is a smooth map, then I'll denote by phi r the r norm, the CR norm. So this will be, let's say, the supremum when x is in 0, 1 to the L, maximum over all derivatives up to order r. And then I'll take the absolute value of f alpha, and I'll normalize by alpha factorial. And so this is one way to define a uh, norm on the space of, uh, ah. now Yossi Omdin is here, so I have to be very careful with how I present his lemma. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so, I mean, you can define these norms in, in various ways. You could take a sum here, for example, uh, I mean, a sum instead of a maximum, so you, measure the size of the tailor, it doesn't really matter. So this is not a delicate point. Uh, any reasonable norm that you put on the CR maps would be kind of equivalent. OK, now let me state the lemma. So this is this Yomdin and Gromov lemma. OK, so I'm going to take a semi-algebraic set in uh, 0, 1 to the n. Um, let's say a dimension of this x will be L. And the complexity, I'll say what I mean by complexity later, will be some beta. Okay, so I mean complexity basically, I mean you have a semi algebraic set, you can write it using polynomial equalities and inequalities, and this complexity <laughs> is the sum of the degrees of all the polynomials polynomials that you use in this presentation. Uh, what's important is that complexity doesn't involve the coefficient. So it only involves degrees of the polynomials, but uh, 
know, any polynomial of a given degree will have the same complexity. Okay, and also I want uh, to fix uh, a certain R. So this will be the disorder of smoothness, an integer R. Okay, then the lemma states the following. There exists phi1 up to phi n. There are charts going from 0, 1 to the L into x. Okay, so L was the dimension of x, so these are kind of like charts on x. Um, okay, such that I want one for every j. These are smooth maps with j. There are norms bounded by one. Okay, so there are kind of smooth charge with an explicit bound of the derivatives. And uh, okay, I want two. I want them to cover the whole thing. So I want the union over j of the images of this phi j to be equal to x. So these are really charts on x. And finally, I want the number and to be some number depending only on the dimension, the ambient dimension, the complexity, and the order of smoothness. Yes? R is equal to sigma? What, what is sigma? Uh, was there is a R is sigma? Was there? Sorry, it's not a sigma, it's just my bad handwriting. And much sigma is going on. There is no sigma. <laughs> much, much later there will be a sigma, maybe two lectures later. It's all R. <laughs> I'll be careful with my R from now on. Uh, okay, so this is the result of the Oh, The really crucial thing to notice there is that, okay, you, you get these charts, it's, if I didn't ask for some uniformity, then this would be maybe not that hard, you could get it from cell decomposition, so the crucial point is that the derivatives are, are bounded by one and we have this uniformity. The number of charts that we get only depends on the complexity and the dimension. It doesn't depend on the particular set that we chose. <coughs> okay, so this is the result. And the way it's usually used is that, well, you have functions, let's say you have some functions on a semi-algebraic set and you want to, let's say, approximate them by polynomials or something like that. Then, okay, first you make these smooth charts, and now every function can be replaced by a Taylor polynomial on the smooth charts. I mean, Taylor polynomial up to order r. Okay, so it allows you to kind of do analysis, like Taylor approximation, for example, on potentially singular semi algebraic sets. Okay, so what uh, I will sketch kind of in the whole series of talks, okay, so we'll sketch. Following theorem, which is joint with Novikov, basically that this n is given by some polynomial, depending only on the dimension in beta and r. Okay, so what I mean by this notation is that there is some polynomial. The polynomial depends on the ambient dimension. <laughs> But as a function of beta and r, things grow polynomially. Okay, so the number of charts grows polynomially with the complexity and the smoothness order. Probably not with the dimension. You know, with the dimension, even if you count, uh, you know, even if you have a, a zero-dimensional set defined in dimension n by equations of degree two, you'll have two to the n components, right, by Bezout. So definitely, you can never expect polynomial growth with respect to dimensions. But with these parameters, you can expect it and. So this was kind of a conjecture of Yomdin, I would say, and it, it had some implications in this direction that he, in the <laughs> dynamics direction that he was working on. So he proved something for smooth maps. He wanted to get a much stronger conclusion for analytic maps, and this was kind of what was needed. I mean, uh, when you have analytic maps, you, are, you can take derivatives up to any order, and then you want to use this somehow, but that means that you should allow yourself to take R to infinity, and understand how things work. And over there, we just had some constant. We didn't know how it depends on R, and that was kind of the problem. 
Okay, so this, so this is the, maybe the initial result that we were going for with this uh, complex analytic techniques. Um, and I'll just mention, a few, I'll make a few remarks about this constant because various people have worked on it. So, yeah, so first of all, if you want to prove that n is a polynomial depending on n and r in beta, so let's say I, I'm just saying that for every fixed n and fixed r, I want to see how it grows as a function of beta. This is essentially due to Gromov. And he, he essentially Gromov. You know, I say essentially because he, he just stated that it's true and he never proved it. <laughs> but I mean, but these were Bourbaki notes, so his notes weren't very detailed, but he, he kind of explained why the dependence on beta should be polynomial. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to do the opposite, if you want to say that n is a polynomial depending, well, on n and beta in R, so now we fix some system of equations and we just ask that we, we increase R and we ask how this will grow. And we want this to grow polynomially, then <laughs> this is, uh, this was done and this is by uh, Clackers, Pila, and Wilkie. Okay, so they use this to prove a certain result uh, in a kind of connected to number theory towards a, a conjecture of Wilkie. And uh, yeah, the problem with their method was that it was really for fixed beta because we were use, they were using some preparation theorems or some, some stuff from subanalytic geometry and they couldn't really control how it depends on beta. Okay, so they got the very nice dependence on R but not depends on beta. So they're kind of two very different approaches and it's not clear that you can combine them. So even though we can get separately the nice dependence on each parameter, we cannot get it both at once. Okay, so our approach is maybe, it's hard to say. It's not exactly a combination of the two, but it's, it definitely has some uh, <coughs> connection to the clackers pillar wilkie approach. Okay, so, so this is the end goal, but I will not really talk about, so I will kind of talk about the theory of complex cells and eventually I will show how it connects to this, but I just wanted to show what the original motivation was. Okay, so the first question for me when I saw this lemma, ah, uh, sorry, one more remark. I forgot, so maybe a third remark. Uh, Pila and Wilkie generalized this Yomdingromov lemma to arbitrary O minimal structures. Okay, so I, I will not give the full statement, but I mean you can imagine that instead of thinking about semi-algebraic sets of a given complexity, you can think about a general definable family in an O minimal structure. And then the claim is that you can parameterize the fibers of this family and this N will be uniform over the whole family. Okay, so they, and I mean the proof is quite similar to the proof of uh, Gromov. Uh, the, the main issue was just to fill some kind of unclear points in the original proof of Gromov. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> does it depend on N or is it not important? Does what depend on N? Uh, so, does what depend on big N? Yes. Uh, does, uh, I didn't understand. Uh, 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 big N depends on the uh, Ah, yeah, it's uh, N here. So it always depends on the ambient dimension and also in this case on the R and in this case on B. Yeah, on the dimension we kind of, we always expect uh, things to depend at least exponentially. Sometimes <laughs> in these things it's even worse than exponentially. So we, we kind of think of the dimension is fixed for most of these results. Okay, yeah, so they generalized it to O minimal structures and there it has some, these applications to number theory. So in fact, when I say that uh, Clackers, Pill and Wilkie did this, it's in a wider context. They didn't do it just for algebraic things, they did it for, let's say, Rn definable sets. So yeah, maybe I should mention. For Rn or even R and how, where you allow yourselves to add also the 
kind of irrational powers here uh, to the language. But never mind, I, I mean, it's, it's not really important. Okay, so when I saw this uh, result, my first kind of a question, that I, I think that, I mean, okay, the statement is beautiful, but the puzzling thing is that you start with really perfect sets, algebraic sets. They are as nice as you can have. But somehow you go to kind of analysis type things. You go to CR smooth maps. It's very unnatural in algebraic geometry. Usually you would have, I don't know, holomorphic maps, analytic maps. So it, it's kind of strange that you have to pass to these smooth CR norms. And I want to explain why this happens. So it's not just that uh, Yomdin and Gromov, uh, uh, I don't know, they, <laughs> they missed the, the simple fix of using holomorphic functions. Instead, there is some actual obstruction here. And I want to explain what it is. So, yeah, maybe another word. <laughs> okay, so the question is why not r is equal to infinity? Okay, this would be, if we could just prove it for r is equal to infinity, then we wouldn't have to worry about how things depend on r. And then this uh, Gromov's result would be fine. I mean, if there was no R, then Gromov would already show us that it's polynomial in beta, and that's all we want. Uh, but in fact, you cannot do R is equal to infinity. Uh, and, and this kind of takes us in the direction of this complex cell stuff. OK, so suppose that a certain map, suppose we have a map phi. And suppose that phi R is, less, say, less than or equal to 1, like in the yom gromov lemma, for every R. Okay, so what would this mean? It, it would mean that basically we have an analytic continuation of phi. Okay, because if we have a bound for all of the derivatives, then the Taylor expansion converges in a, you know, a ball of radius 1. Uh, so it would mean that phi extends uh, to, let's say, to a neighborhood of size 1 half of this 0, 1 and bounded there. Okay, so but by this neighborhood, I mean that you have, okay, we have 0, 1, and then I make a neighborhood of radius 1 half. So this is my, this is 1 half here. Okay, so if we had all derivatives bounded by 1, we would have automatic, I mean, it would even extend to a neighborhood of radius 1, but then on the boundary of this neighborhood, it would maybe explode to infinity. But I can make the neighborhood a little bit smaller, radius 1 half, and then it would be bounded like by 1, my function. So it will be a function with a nice analytic continuation and bounded. This is kind of the best kind of functions. I would like to get yom gromov with these kind of functions. Then I'm using really holomorphic functions, and I don't have to pass to some strange analysis type uh, objects. OK, so the question is, can we prove the same lemma with just with these, this kind of map, so with having all the derivatives bounded? OK, so to show the problem, let me consider an example that uh, Yomdin came up with. So I'll consider uh, x epsilon in, uh, in C2. So this would be a complex curve, and it will be given by x epsilon. I want x and y to be less than or equal to 1. And I want x, y to be equal to epsilon. OK, so I'm taking, the, taking a box, and I'm taking the hyperbola here. And I'll also consider a slightly bigger hyperbola, uh, which I will confusingly denote by x to the 1 half. <gasps> okay, so later you will see that it's some kind of systematic notation, but maybe in this context it, it will be kind of confusing. But anyway, just consider it as a notation. So here I'll take x and y to be less than or equal to 2. Okay, and, and the same equation. So I'm just kind of analytically continuing this guy here. So I'll have a bigger box. And I take the same thing. 
Okay, so these are complex, but finally the yomding rom of lemma is about the real things, not complex things. So I'll really be thinking about, let's say, the intersection of this guy with R2. Okay, so it will be just the standard people <laughs> one. Uh, okay, so the question is, can I cover the intersection of this with R2 using uh, finitely many this, uh, maps with having all derivatives bound? So let's suppose that I can. So yeah, so suppose, is this, vi yeah, this is visible, this height, right? Up to, it's visible up to here? Yeah, okay. So suppose, uh, are there any questions so far? <coughs> I'll suppose that phi one up to phi n, uh, so let me see, how do I want to do this? I'll take maps from 0, 1 to x epsilon intersect R2. Okay, so I'm considering kind of a yomding gom of type maps. I want maps from 0, 1 into this real part of the hyperbola. Uh, and I want them to to have the two properties that I always ask for. So I want them to have this phi j infinity norm is less than or equal to one. So by this I mean just that all of the derivatives are less than one. And I want them to cover the whole thing. I want the union of the images of phi j to be equal to x epsilon intersect R2. Okay, so if I could do this, then I have kind of accomplished the yomding rom of lemma using uh, analytic maps. Uh, okay. okay, so first of all, because I assume that I have all of these derivatives bounded, then as I said, these maps will continue analytically. Okay, so. I can extend them analytically, phi j, it will actually go from this neighborhood of radius one half of zero one, and where will it go? So in zero one, zero one is taken into the hyperbola. Uh, that was my assumption. So when I analytically continue, it will still satisfy the, you know, the equation, this is an analytic equation. So analytic continuation will preserve this equation, but it will, not necessarily stay in x epsilon because I, I only say that you know, things are bounded by one on zero one. Okay, so it might go a little bit outside this, uh, these inequalities when I analytically continue, but it will still satisfy these inequalities. You can just estimate the, these converging Taylor expansions and you'll see that even when you go to a little bit bigger neighborhood, both coordinates have to be bounded by two. So this will go into this x epsilon one half here. Like this is why I needed this bigger neighborhood. Okay, and I claim that now we will be able to use some kind of geometry of Riemann surfaces, the geometry of x epsilon inside x epsilon one half to, to reach a kind of contradiction. Uh, but in order to do that, I have to, uh, I have to assume something about Riemann surfaces. So I have to assume that you know um, that every hyperbolic Riemann surface has a canonical metric, so uh, how many of you know the canonical metric of a hyperbolic Riemann surface? <laughs> Not many. Okay, so let me, <laughs> so let me quickly uh, remind you of this. So it's, it's a very beautiful theory, so even if you don't learn anything from my talk ex except for this uh, theory of <laughs> metrics on Riemann surface, it would be uh, time well spent. Okay, so, so I'll do a quick reminder on hyperbolic metrics. Surfaces. Okay, so Riemann surfaces, they are divided into kind of three types, and almost all of them are hyperbolic. So basically, let's take a, X will be a Riemann surface.
And I'll assume that it's not equal to C, some quotient of C, or CP1. OK, so this quotient of C, it could be either quotient by a subgroup generated by one element, then it's like a, a tube. Or it can be a quotient by a subgroup generated by two <coughs> elements, and then it would be an elliptic curve. So I'm ruling out all of these, which are not hyperbolic. But if we are not in one of these, then there's a universal cover of x by a disk. So this is a universal cover. So this is the Riemann mapping theorem. And then whenever you have this universal cover, because this guy has a canonical hyperbolic metric, and uh, the group of conformal automorphisms of D preserves this metric, then the metric descends to x. So x inherits, inherits hyperbolic metric um, from D. Let's say curvature equal to minus 1. So, I mean, this metric is defined up to a constant multiple, so by normalizing the curvature, you can... So, if, if I require that the metric has curvature minus 1 everywhere, this determines the metric completely, it would be exactly like making this kind of universal cover and then taking the usual metric of curvature minus 1 here, the Poincaré metric. And what I need you to know about this metric is very simple, only one very beautiful fact. So, there's a lemma or... Theorem, I don't know. Anyway, a result by Schwartz Peak, which says that if F is a holomorphic map, holomorphic between uh, hyperbolic Riemann surfaces, surfaces. then F is contracting. Uh, well, I should say weakly contracting. Okay, so every holomorphic map uh, is contracting or non-increasing this hyperbolic metric. Okay, so even though, I mean, this is just a holomorphic map, we don't make any kind of assumptions about the derivative or anything like that. It has to contract this hyperbolic metric. And the way you prove it is very simple. It's, it's simply because this metric comes from D. So if you have a map from X to Y, you can lift it to a map from D to D. Just apply this universal cover functor. And then when you have a map from D to D, this is basically the Schwarz lemma. Okay, the Schwarz lemma says that if you have a map from D to D, it's contracting the metric. It's even strongly contracting unless your map is just uh, an automorphism. So, so that's all that I will need. Okay, and I, I mean, I claim that this kind of hyperbolic obstruction will explain what goes wrong with the picture there. Yes. I mean, here, here I cannot, because this n1 half, this is like the complex neighborhood. So, I mean, these analytic continuations, they will, you know, they will go to s just into C. So, yeah, I have these maps that on the real line, they go to R, like here, but now I continue them to a neighborhood of, of the real line, and in this analytic <coughs> continuation, they would go somewhere. Okay, so I have... I, I, I mean, it's distance non-increasing. So the distance between fx and fy is bounded by distance between x and y. And usually it's actually contracting, unless it's really an automorphism. Uh, but that would not be important for me. Uh, okay. Let me go back. Okay, so what we have here basically is this, the kind of picture where Schwarz peak can work. Okay, we have a line inside the neighborhood, 
and this is mapped into this x1 half where inside x1 half we have the part that we want to to cover right we are hoping to cover at least this part and the map goes into this bigger part Okay, so what, do we, what does Schwarz Peak tell, uh, tell us? It tells us that the diameter of a uh, phi j of 0, 1 uh, inside n, uh, I'm sorry, inside x 1 half epsilon, this is less than or equal to the diameter of 0, 1 inside of this uh, n 1 half 0, 1. Okay, because this map is contracting the distances. So when I took 0, 1 inside of its neighborhood, it's contracting the distance when it maps here, so it will decrease the diameter, or at least not increase the diameter. Okay, is this part clear? Okay, so we we get a bound that it basically tells us that every map like this that we can consider, it cannot cover too much, right? There's a bound on the diameter. Oh, and I should say that this diameter is just a constant. Because here, the, here there are no parameters that are moving. This is just 0, 1 inside the 1 half neighborhood of 0, 1. So this is like, I don't know, pi or something with some universal constant. So every map that we take covers just a constant piece of the, of the blue line with the hyperbolic diameter. And then the question is, what do we know about the length of the blue line or the diameter of the blue line with respect to the hyperbolic diameter? Here there is some parameter, right? There's epsilon that is moving. But here we have every map covers some constant part. So the only question is, as we change epsilon, is this, the length of this line staying fixed or is it going to infinity? And I claim that you can compute this quite easily, which I will not do, but I will explain how to. <laughs> how to compute it. Uh, so, uh, okay, but first of all, let me say that what, I, what all of this implies is that uh, n, the number of maps that we need, is greater or equal to the diameter of this x epsilon inside x epsilon 1 half. Well, I mean, up to a constant, because there was some constant here, but up to a constant, if every piece covers some constant part, then the number of pieces we need is at least like this diameter. Uh, and I'm claiming that this diameter is actually equal to log, log epsilon. Okay, the log of the absolute value of log epsilon. So as epsilon tends to zero, this thing is going to infinity. It's going to infinity very slowly, like a double logarithm, but still it's going to infinity. And that means that if you try to do yomding Gromov with r is equal to infinity, then for x epsilon, you would need at least this many maps. So it degenerates, we will not have this nice uniformity where things depend only on the, on the complexity. So that's why yomding Gromov is impossible. And let me just quickly explain how to see this. So the thing to note is that, is that if we, take uh, the projection map, so I take this map x, y that goes to x, and this gives us a very nice uh, biholomorphism between x epsilon and annulus. So I claim that this x epsilon will correspond to an annulus epsilon 1. Okay, because we want the x coordinate to be bounded by 1, and we also want the y coordinate to be bounded by 1, but y is epsilon over x. So it means that x actually should be bigger than epsilon. Okay, and for the same reason, x epsilon 1 half, I mean by the same map, it goes to another annulus. Annulus epsilon over 2 and 2. Okay, so these are actually, I mean, you can think that this is exceptional. These are my Riemann surfaces. And these are very classical domains. You can find 
their canonical metric essentially by hand and you can compute and you can see that if you take this annulus inside the metric of this annulus then this is how the diameter behaves. Okay, so this is really the obstruction to yom ding -Romov, and this will be kind of the main actor in this notion of complex cells. So the idea will be to study things that look like annuli inside their extensions and that the, this metric will kind of control everything about these annuli. But okay, first I wanted to make some remarks. Yeah. So this inequality. Yeah. yeah. So here we are looking at the. So what the inequality about Riemann surfaces basically says is that the map is contracting the distances, right? So in particular, it means that the map is contracting the diameters. If you have a set and you take the image, the diameter of the set can only decrease because the map is increasing the metric. Right. So here I'm saying that the diameter of the image. This is the image of uh, zero one will be smaller than the diameter of zero one. So it, it's basically just saying that when I take this map, I, apl I apply the map to zero one and it, the diameter of it gets shrunk here. Well, I mean, this is some set inside the Riemann. So yeah, this is not a Riemann surface, it's just an interval. But I mean, what uh, Schwarzbeck speaks says is that take any subset of x, not just a Riemann surface, take some k in x, and diameter of k will okay. be smaller than diameter of f of k. Right. Any other questions? Please, please ask questions. <laughs> uh, OK, so. I mean, uh, okay, uh, where I wrote r is equal to infinity, I just meant that I, I mean, so by this I meant uh, that, I, I assume, sorry, I assume this for every r. And also that is equal to parametric. Or to that? Well, I mean, uh, initially I just took functions only on 0, 1, and with all derivatives bounded. But if all the derivatives are bounded everywhere, then actually the function extends to an analytic function. But if, if you have a function and you assume that all of the derivatives are bounded by 1, then the function actually, you know, it has an, uh, an analytic expansion that's converging, and it converges to the function, because, you know, the error is controlled by, by the R, you know, if, if you do an R, Taylor polynomial, you can estimate the error by the r plus first one, and this estimate will go to zero because all the derivatives are bounded. Yeah, so I, I'm saying that they all continue analytically, yeah, and I mean they are equal to their to this analytic continuation. Okay, so the conclusion was uh, conclusion from all this computation is that n should be greater or equal to log log epsilon. And I claim that, I mean, this is really the only obstruction. This is kind of the, this shows you what is going on, because actually log log epsilon is possible. So uh, one remark is that n equals log log epsilon is possible. Okay, so this is an exercise you can actually using log log epsilon maps, you can cover this uh, thing. And uh, an easy way to see it is to think about these annuli. So really what we want to do is cover the annulus, A epsilon one, by analytic maps that kind of stay in the slightly bigger annulus. And then you can pass to logarithmic charts and you, you can do it quite easily. However, there's a little bit of an interesting uh, phenomenon here that I wanted to mention, which is that if we assume that uh, all of my, our phi j's are equivalent, 
So if I bound the valency of my maps, if I assume that they are equivalent, so for instance, if I was trying to do things definably, then I would want things to be definable in families, and the phi j's would be defined in families, everything would be equivalent for some bounded fixed p. Then n should be greater, should be at least log epsilon. So this is much stronger. So this is basically due to Yomdin. So I mean, in fact, if you look up Yomdin's paper where he showed this, he doesn't even say that they all have to be equivalent, but he kind of just assumed, because he was working in a definable situation, that the functions are equivalent for some fixed. I should write maybe a little p here to make it clear. So I'm saying if you assume that they are equivalent for some fixed p, then there's up to some multiplicative factor depending on p, you need at least log epsilon. So here I have much fewer, like exponentially fewer maps. To do this, you have to use maps that are kind of highly oscillating. They will cover the same point many times, which is kind of counterintuitive because, I mean, we are trying to cover the set using as few charts as possible. And somehow, in order to do it with few charts, the, the charts have to cover the same point many, many times. So there is some kind of, uh, you know, interplay between the conformal metric and uh, this standard metric here. So it, it's something like the Kobe theorem that makes this stronger conclusion hold. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry. So p-valent just means uh, that you know the number of times that you take any given w is uh, bounded by p. But uh, I mean, this assumption of p-valency, you could state it in various ways. Uh, you can say that some growth indices are bounded. I mean, th th there are many kind of roughly equivalent ways of stating this. But basically, it means that if you are trying to take all your maps in some definable family where everything remains bounded, then you have uh, you need a lot more charts. Okay? You need log epsilon instead of log log epsilon. Um, okay, so, so this was kind of the first thing that we did. We wanted to understand why you cannot use uh, holomorphic maps, which would be much nicer. And we saw that there is this uh, obstruction. There's an actual obstruction. But, I mean, you can notice that the obstruction really was about uh, kind of, or at least in this example, the, exam the obstruction was about annuli. So we are kind of basically trying to cover with disks, or, okay, we, we thought about zero, one in here, but you, you could think about a disk inside a little bit bigger disk. That's what you do when you use holomorphic functions. If we have holomorphic functions, let's say we, we want them to be defined on a disk of radius uh, one and expand to a disk of radius two, and then we are trying to cover everything with the smaller disks. And then there's an obstruction because the hyperbolic uh, diameter of the disk inside the bigger disk is bounded. And the hyperbolic size of the annulus inside the bigger annulus is not bounded. So this is kind of why it can't work. Uh, and then there's the question, is there another obstruction? Let's say I, I allowed annuli as my domains instead of allowing disks. So would there still be an obstruction? Yeah. So I just mean it's bigger to uh, bigger than some constant depending on p times log epsilon. Uh, so like p is the dependency of the asymptotic constants. Uh, other questions? Okay. So the question is, um, can we do a holomorphic? if we allow annuli as domains. Okay, so instead of asking for functions that are defined on a disk, I'm going to ask for functions that are defined on an interval, uh, on an annulus. And then this kind of counterexample definitely wouldn't work because here, X epsilon actually was an annulus, right? So it's kind of covered by one annulus. Uh, okay, so I want to show a, a little proposition 
which is kind of a baby case of this uh, complex cell type construction. So let me do something like uh, what we did here. So I'll let P be some polynomial. So before this was just x, y minus epsilon. And now I'll take a general polynomial. And I'll consider xp to be you know, x and y are bounded by 1. And p is equal to 0. And xp 1 half. This will be the same with x and y bounded by 2. Okay, and now what the proposition says is that then there exist phi1 up to phij defined from cj into xp1 half, where every cj, sorry, every cj, this is going to be a disk or an annulus. So I'm claiming that there is a collection of maps from uh, disks or annuli into this. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I needed also a little half here. So I want, so CJ is going to be a disk or an annulus, and this CJ one half is going to be exactly as I had it there. So if it's a disk, it will be a bigger disk, and if it's an annulus, it will be a bigger annulus, like, like x epsilon and x epsilon one half there. OK, such that, um, well, 1 is that they cover everything. So the union over j of phi j of c contains xp. OK, so the functions are defined on a slightly bigger domain, on so the domain x to the c, j to the 1 half. But if I look at the image of the smaller domains, this already covers xp. And the number of maps is bounded by a polynomial in uh, degree of p. OK, so that kind of recovers Yom Dingromo for us, at least for this case of curves in C2. OK, I'm saying that now these maps are, I'm sorry, I didn't say, but I mean that these are holomorphic maps. So now I have holomorphic maps, and they're converging in bigger domains. And if you consider the image of the smaller domains, they will cover our set XP. So this is exactly what we couldn't do for the hyperbola there. I'm saying that we can do it for every algebraic curve. And it works kind of uniformly in the, it depends only on the degree. There isn't such a the generation where like epsilon goes to zero and something has to generate. So at least in this case, the, this kind of problem with annuli was the only problem. Once we allow annuli, we can do it. And okay, why would this be useful? I mean, first we wanted maps defined on intervals. Then I said, well, this is like doing analytic continuation. And then I said, okay, now let's go from a disk to an annulus. So the reason that this is should be useful is that Yom Dingromov is usually used to do Taylor approximations. Okay, so if we have a, an interesting set, we can cover it by intervals, and then on e every interval we can write a Taylor approximation. And if you have annuli, you have something that's basically as good. You have Laurent approximations. So if if now I have a function that's defined on xp one half, I can pull it back to these CJs. They will be annuli. And I can do Laurent approximation of my function on the annulus. And it will converge kind of with the same rate as Taylor approximations. Once you know the function is bounded on this bigger domain, then you have good bounds of the rate of convergence in the smaller domain. So this is kind of the correct analog of Yom Dingromov if you want, I mean, for the applications. Uh, so this is a reason to consider these uh, CJs. OK. Can I do two at once here? No, two at once doesn't work. It's just a second. 
second. Uh, five, oh, sorry, right, right, right. No, sorry. Maybe I should use this very fancy eraser. Yeah, maybe the probably the French people should show me how to use it later. Right? Hmm? This? No. On the box. Yeah, yeah. This I I used. Yeah, it it just uh, leaves it a bit smooshed. No, oh, but I mean, I remember from my previous visits to CERM that the, you know the experienced French people they use this thing and then it's super clean. So actually, it's German. <laughs> ah, it's a German uh, yeah, thing. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So they, they renovated all of CERM, but they 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 left this very nice uh, <laughs> sophisticated eraser. Okay, so I will not really show the proof of this proposition because I have four minutes left. But I will, I will kind of just sketch what is the kind of how to prove it under some simplifying assumption, and I leave it as an exercise. Okay, so kind of a proof. So let's let's make a, a simplifying assumption that's really, I mean, it, it simplifies things. It's not a trivial uh, simplification. Simplifying assumption. <coughs> So I want to assume that if I take pi x, y is equal to x, so I project just to the x coordinate, I want to assume that this pi uh, restricted to x, p, 1 half is proper. OK, what this means geometrically is that I have my uh, I have this is the like this you know, disk of radius two times itself. This is where x p one half lives, and I'm saying that x p one half looks something like this. So this map is a proper map. There, there are no branches that escape to infinity when I make this projection. So in fact, whenever you have an algebraic curve, you can cut it up into pieces like this where this works, but, but let's forget about this for a moment. Okay, so if you have this kind of picture, it's relatively easy to try to make charts with disks and annuli just by kind of inverting the map. Okay, so I'm going to, so let's take uh, sigma. Uh, let's, let's let this be the ramification locus. inside C. Okay, so it's, for example, it would be this point where I have a ramified. So this would be sigma. And now if I have any annulus or disk that's disjoint from sigma, I can just invert the map. Well, if I have a disk, I can invert the map and I would get several holomorphic branches. And if I have an annulus, then I can invert the map, well, maybe up to some finite uh, order of ramification. So if I compose with this covering map, I would again be able to invert the map. So basically what it boils down to is you know what I mean I the, the next picture is important and I really have only 1 minute left so maybe let me stop and I'll continue next time but you can try to think a bit about this picture and how if you have you know let's say you have several ramification points here how can you cover everything using finitely many disks and annuli and why you wouldn't be able to do it if you used only disks uh, uniformly. OK, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Question. Just 
Sorry, if this theorem by, uh, by, uh, by Garen uh, Morris. Um, uh, this had an immediate uh, implications in, in dynamics. This involves also a long standing conjecture about the error of uh, topological entropy for analytic methods in, 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 di uh, in dynamics. And uh, um, just uh, the experimental bound was a problem for many. Yes, and let me uh, mention uh, the name of David Bourguet, uh, who contributed in, in earlier development, and uh, then by his results, this theorem implied uh, immediately the answer to the, to the dynamic. Um, um, okay. Uh, okay, and uh, just one word, uh, because it's absolutely possible to move uh, the dynamics. Um, uh, uh, Recently, uh, David Bourget has developed a kind of uh, um, a kind of this uh, covering lemma of uh, smooth parameterization uh, lem um, lemma for curves, but in dynamical situation with much more accurate situation. And this brought other uh, extremely important developments in smooth dy dynamics. This is very recent, last year. <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay, thank you. Yeah, maybe I should have mentioned uh, among this uh, known results, I think maybe David Bourget also proved this uh, result with a polynomial, you know, as we want, polynomial in both beta and R only for curves. So I think he has such a, so maybe among these uh, previously known results, you can also say that n is a polynomial in, uh, in beta and R when little n is equal to one, when the dimension is one. I, I think he had such a result. <laughs> Are there other questions? So thank you for this very interesting talk and uh, we thank can prepare questions for the for the next episode. Okay, thank you. <laughs>